Welcome back. Last time, we, or rather, I, you just sat there, talked about the climate crisis and about tipping points, feedback loops, societal collapse, and billions of people dying. You know, fun stuff. I also said that the reason why the plant is warming is because of more greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. But I skirted around the issue as to exactly why that is so. So, why is that so? Well, among many, many other things, cars, cows, and coal. All of this emits CO2 and or methane, which contributes to global warming. And humans drive cars, raise and eat cattle, and burn coal, so human activity is causing climate change and has changed the Earth system so profoundly that many scientists suggest that we've left the Holocene and entered, or rather created, a whole new geological epoch, the Anthropocene, the age of the human. But some disagree with this. Among them, me. I know, I know, it's, it's a hot take. A hot take for a hot world. I think this is too reductionist. To explain why, imagine I was smiling one day and you asked, Hey, why are you so happy? And I responded, Ah, you see, there's so much serotonin flowing around in my brain and causing good feelings. That wouldn't be a satisfying answer now, would it? Even if technically true, it wouldn't actually explain why I'm happy. And of course, the real reason I'm happy is because... Yeah, cars, cows, and coal emit greenhouse gases, but it doesn't really explain why there's so much more of them in the atmosphere now. It's not humans per se that are to blame, because only 10% of humans are responsible for 50% of greenhouse gas emissions. And if you take a historical perspective, like roughly 80% of greenhouse gas emissions are because of 20% of humans. So blaming all of humanity with a term such as the Anthropocene is inaccurate and kind of unfair. It's not humanity, but something else related to humanity, or a small segment of it, that's to blame. So why do we drive cars? Why do we raise cattle? And why do we burn coal? Just as I felt it was prudent to point out that I'm not a science person, I should note that I'm not an economist either. You can't really fault me for it though, since apparently you need to have gone to Hogwarts first. You silly goose, you're, you're, you're not a wizard. You don't have magic powers. Okay, to be fair, they do know how to conjure an invisible hand. Still, this muggle right here is gonna try to explain how the economy is to put it diplomatically, complicit in the climate crisis. Let's dig in. <sighs> like climate change, you can describe the economy as a feedback loop. The goal of the economic system is accumulation, which is a fancy way of saying make all the money. Accumulation is the goal as well as the engine of the system. It's means as well as its end. You gotta spend money to make money. And it follows from that that you can spend that money you made to make even more money. And you can then spend that money to make even more money. And so on and so on. See how there's a feedback loop there? Let's make it clear by the following formula. But first you need to remove the uninspired Inspiring message. Now you take some money and you spend that money to produce a commodity, i.e. anything you can buy and sell. And then you sell that commodity for more money than you spent making it, thus making a profit. A little mark there. Basic and self-evident, right? So much so that I totally came up with this formula all on my own. I most certainly did not copy this from a 19th century German critic of political economy. To make even more money, 
you simply put the profit back into production and repeat the process, getting another mark. Do that again. Another mark. And again. Another mark. And so on and 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 on. And congratulations! You're making money. You're doing so good for yourself right now. And you can repeat as many times as you like. There is no limit to how much money you can make. It's not that you need all of it, but um, once you get locked into a serious money collection, the tendency is to push it as far as you can. Now, you might have noticed a problem here. How do I make money if I have none in the first place? Why you get a loan? Say, a small loan of a million dollars. Usually from a bank, but in principle the loan could come from anywhere or anyone. Now of course, people won't lend you money just for fun. They expect something in return. They're interested in something. In their eyes, you're part of their little formula. They give you money and you pay them back more than they lent you in the first place. Repeat that for everyone and you basically have the global economy. Everybody follows this formula. Just a whole bunch of individuals acting in their own rational self-interest, competing to accumulate as much money as possible. And thus we get economic growth, most commonly measured as GDP. Or ew, gross domestic product. The growth imperative is mutually reinforced by businesses, banks, the stock market, and governments. It's all about growth. Growth all the way down. And here we come to the problem. Economic growth correlates with greenhouse gas emissions. And not only that, look at these graphs. GDP growth correlates with deforestation, biodiversity loss, overfishing, ocean acidification, global temperature rise, environmental degradation all around. Now, of course, correlation does not imply causation. I know that. I, for one, have seen plenty of Nick Cage movies without once having drowned in a pool. But there is good reason to think that the link between GDP and CO2 is more than just a funny coincidence. There is good reason to think that one causes the other. Why? Well, the whole point is to make and sell commodities for a profit. And commodities don't come out of thin air. To make something, you need materials and resources. And where do you get that? Don't answer because I already know. Nature. In short, to make a profit, you need to convert nature into commodities. This doesn't contribute to GDP, but this does. Especially now that Brazil is under new management. Since Mother Nature has no social security number and no claim to property rights, she's basically a freebie. She, she's nice and generous that way. So buy whatever land you like and extract the resources that are there to your heart's content. Not on your own, of course. I mean, have you ever been down in a mine? It's awful. There's no Wi-Fi there. No, it's better to make someone else do it. Luckily, there are always people desperate, I mean determined enough to do whatever you like for lousy pay. Maybe they have debts at the colonial store. Pay your labor force as little as you can get away with. That's good for your profit margin. Don't let them organize. That leaves us with two ways of making money. One, exploit, I mean employ people. And two, destroy, I mean develop nature. The point is that you need nature to have economic growth in the first place. So it makes sense that GDP correlates with all that environmental damage, which is disconcerting considering that um, the economy needs to grow forever while nature is finite. 
and the economy is expected to quadruple by 2050. That's supposed to be a good thing, but uh, if the past is anything to go by, then uh, sheesh. Apart from labor and nature, there is something else you need. Energy to extract resources and make commodities and transport everything and generally just living. You need energy. And for the past quarter millennium, we've used fossil fuels for that purpose. You just simply couldn't have gotten all that economic growth without them. And so GDP also correlates with energy use as well as emissions. As I'm sure you know, fossil fuels emit carbon. Fossil fuels are so integral to the functioning of the economic system that Ian Angus wrote this. Fossil fuels are not an overlay that can be peeled away from ca... I've avoided naming the system because like once you mention it in a critical way, a lot of people either roll their eyes or they get really defensive and say stuff like stop complaining, get a job, you communist, or that's a you problem, or set your house in perfect order before criticizing the world. But saying the economic system gets unwieldy after a while. So from now on, I'll instead call it the... Uh something related to money. Yeah, that works. Let's call it kitchenism. Starting over. Fossil fuels are not an overlay that can be peeled away from kitchenism, leaving the system intact. They are embedded in every aspect of the system. And that makes known reserves of fossil fuels very, very valuable. To take oil, for instance. Even at a low price in 2016, at $31.60 a barrel, known reserves of oil were worth $50 trillion. Holy smokes, that's almost 400 Jeff Bezos's. Bezos's? Bezos's? The human ecologist Andreas Malm, uh, that is, he's not simply a, an ecologist that happens to be human, like human ecology is its own field and he is a human ecologist. Um, anyway, he coined the term fossil kitchenism and posited this law. Where kitchen goes, emissions will immediately follow. The stronger global kitchen has become, the more rampant the growth of CO2 emissions. And he's on to something. CO2 as well as GDP growth has only sped up since 1950 or so, like the start of what's often called the Great Acceleration. In fact, the only times in history we've seen substantial drops in carbon emissions are during times of economic crises. So, a recession in 2020, like a lot of wizards are predicting, might not be all that bad. It could be good for the environment for a year or two. So from all this, it seems to me that endless economic growth is the problem. Now, you might object to that by saying that what we need is more growth because growth eventually leads to energy and resource efficiency and thus lower emissions and lower pressure on the environment. You might say that carbon emissions will decouple from GDP, that they will follow an environmental costness curve, where at first they go up along with GDP and then plateaus and then goes down while GDP continues to go up, like so. And thus, we could continue to pursue endless economic growth. If you think this will happen, you've probably never heard of Jevons' paradox. In the 19th century, William Stanley Jevons wrote a book called The Coal Question. In the book, Jevons notes something peculiar. 
even though steam engines by that time had become more efficient, i.e. they needed less coal to produce the same amount of energy, overall use of coal was still going up. What the funk? You'd expect people to use less coal as engines got more efficient, right? Hence Javon's paradox. But if you spend more than 10 seconds thinking about it, it's not really that strange or paradoxical. I mean, you just bought a new fancy steam engine, right? And you're saving money on coal. As a businessman, man, because it's 19th century, what do you do with those savings? Perhaps buy more coal and get more energy and increase production and make even greater profits? Maybe? I mean, as an individual acting in your own rational self-interest, it's the sensible thing to do. Jevon's paradox doesn't just apply to coal, though. It applies to resource and energy use in general. For instance, cars are more fuel efficient now than they were 50 years ago, but overall consumption of gasoline, it's gone up. And yes, we have loads more renewable energy now than just 10 years ago, but the use of fossil fuels hasn't gone down. Renewables tend to be an add-on rather than a replacement in the energy mix. So Javon's paradox is a major thorn in the side to the idea of green growth. But decoupling can still happen, right? Maybe, in theory. In practice, it's not likely, though. The European Environmental Bureau released a report last summer that looked at all the decoupling literature, and they concluded that there is no empirical evidence to suggest that decoupling is actually happening, except in some narrowly defined circumstances, like in one country for two years or something like that. Even then, usually it wasn't really decoupling, Often, a developed nation just moved a polluting industry to a poor one, and that translates to, hey, our emissions are lower now. Look how eco-friendly we are. The authors of the report found no good reason to think that absolute global and permanent decoupling is happening anytime soon at anything like the rate it needs to happen if we're not going to plunge into a climate hellscape. The title of the report is Decoupling Debunked, which is kind of giving away the conclusion at the start, isn't it? It would be a bit like if you called your crime novel The Butler Did It. Here's the cover of the report, and look, there's the environmental Cosnets curve, and there's green economic growth. You can tell because it's green. But plot twist, it's the Loch Ness Monster. Get it? because it doesn't exist. <sighs> so, based on this report and historical evidence and the fact that Kachingism is a grow or die system, it seems clear to me that we don't live in the Anthropocene, but rather the Kachingocene. Because you know that 10% of humans causing half the carbon emissions? Those are the richest 10%. So Kachingism is the underlying cause of carbon emissions, which causes global warming, which causes climate change, which causes climate crisis, which causes climate emergency, which might lead to uh, an admittedly low probability but still absolutely possible scenario that might kill us all, which causes me to... Right, we know the problem and we have a pretty good idea of what's causing it, so now we can posit a solution. End Kachingism. Right? Well, the problem with that is that ending Kachingism is really, 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 really hard. 
so hard that uh, leftists who have been all about ending kitchenism for 150 years or so now, sum it up with this quote. It is easier to imagine the end of the world than the end of kitchenism. This quote is so widespread that you could call it a meme. Hashtag the left can meme. Speaking of the late Mark Fisher, he wrote a book called Kitchingist Realism, which is all about how difficult ending kitchenism is. It's so hard that the resignation to that fact has become part of our very being and outlook on the world. Kitchingist realism is like a pervasive atmosphere, conditioning not only the production of culture, but also the regulation of work and education, and acting as a kind of invisible barrier constraining thought and action. The subtitle of that book, Is There No Alternative?, echoes the words of Margaret Thatcher. UK Prime Minister in the 80s, who famously said there is no alternative to Kachingism. And to this day, many people believe her. It's common sense. The system might not be perfect, but it works. Or so people say. Even economists are highly critical of Kachingism, such as Hyun Chang, who wrote the great myth-busting book 23 things they don't tell you about Kitchingism, still says that Kitchingism is the worst economic system except for all the others we've tried. Which I personally think is a bit like saying that chemotherapy is the worst cure for cancer except for all the others we've tried and therefore we shouldn't try to find other cures for cancer, but whatever, I I'm just a useless humanities person. From all this, we have two premises. One, Kitchingism is inherently ecologically unsustainable. Two, there is no alternative. It follows from this that we're fucked. Wait, we're not ending the video now, are we? This, this is a super bleak note to end on. No, this is way too depressing. Oh, I'm, I'm gonna be sending people into therapy. Oh, watch out. You might find what you're after. Boom, babies. Strange but not a stranger. I'm an ordinary guy. Burning down the house. Hold tight. Wait till the party's over That's right We're in for nasty weather There has got to be a way Burning down the house Here's your ticket, pack your bags Time for jumping overboard The transportation is here Close enough but not too far Baby, you know where you are Fighting fire with fire All wet Hey, you might need a raincoat Shake down Dreams walking in broad daylight 365 degrees Burning down the house It was once upon a place Sometimes I listen to myself Gonna come in first place People on the way to work say, baby, what did you expect? Fighting fire with fire My house is out of the ordinary That's right, don't wanna hurt nobody Some things sure can sweep me off my feet Burning down the house A visible means of support and you have not seen nothing yet Everything stuck together I don't know what you expect Staring into the TV set Fighting fire with fire Our house is on fire Our house is on fire Fire and fury Like the world has never seen
Our house is on fire. Our house is on fire and fury. Our house is on fire and fury. Our house is on fire and fury. Like the world has never seen. Our house is on fire and fury. Like the world is on fire.